to see you on this cold and blustery Sunday morning. It's a delight to have you here, and I hope that you find our time together to be warm and inviting this morning. So it's good to have you here. Please stand as we continue our worship, and we want to make sure that we speak the name of Jesus loud and clear and give him the praise.
Well, I'm certainly glad that you have come this morning to be part of our worship service here. And for those of you who are joining us on our YouTube channel, thank you for tuning in. And we hope that our worship service will bless your heart today. Well, if you did not sit in the front two rows here, you really missed out. For all of you slackers back there in the back rows, because up front here, we have candy on the front seats. So if you would like a piece of candy, you need to sit up front, at, right here in the center, okay? And you can see that's where Pastor Jesse sat, of course, because... Uh, but uh, so, you know, you just never know when uh, there's going to be candy showing up on the front seat. So make sure that you sit towards the front, okay? Coming up in a week and a half, we have a congregational business meeting. That's Wednesday night, November 30. And you'll hear some of our end of year business and decide on adding a volunteer coordinator position to our church staff. There's information in your mailboxes. So if you have not checked your mailboxes, please check your mailbox because there's information there. So we hope that you will come out on Wednesday night, November 30. Also, uh, some of you have your affirmation sheets for offices. Um, you can either put that in the offering box in the back here or by the folder, the file folder by the office door. So you can return those Affirmation sheets there. December 2nd, Friday night, December 2nd, there's a women's event here at Waterway. Um, you need to have a free ticket because they'd like to know how many people are coming. So get your free ticket in the lobby after our worship service. Christmas Day is approaching, and we will have one worship service at 1030. There will be no Sunday school just a worship service at 10.30. However, at 10 o'clock, they're going to have coffee and donuts and some light refreshments. So come at 10 Christmas Day and then stay for the worship service at 10.30. So that's our schedule for Christmas Day. No Sunday school, uh, no children's ministries that day. It would just be everyone in here for the worship service on Christmas Day. Hey, senior adults, there is a survey in your mailbox. Please fill it out and then return those surveys to me, okay? So take time to fill out that survey and return them to me. Also, the Bible Escape Room is back again this year. So Reuben and Rachel Bender sitting up here in the front because they got all candy. They wanted candy. So they're sitting up front here, and uh, they are doing a Bible-themed escape room, and so you can check with them about details concerning that. So thanks, Reuben and Rachel, for the Bible-themed escape room. As you saw in the hallway, there's lots of shoeboxes and lots of big cartons with shoeboxes in them. Um, we collected around 560 shoeboxes. And from what Jess told me, just about half of that amount came from Waterway Church. So good job. Good job, Waterway Church. That is incredible. So thanks for your participation in this project. Uh, Jess Engel is looking for some help. We need some people to help load the cartons of shoeboxes and drop them off um, in a central location down towards Philadelphia area. Um, if you can help, please let Jess Engel know. Um, you meet at their farm at 1 o'clock and you'll be back by about 3.30, something like that. So if you can help pack up the big cartons in a trailer to take uh, to the central location, that would be awesome. So please let Jess know. If you still have shoeboxes, please bring them in, okay? Um, the church will be open today from 1 to 4, and also tomorrow from 9 to 11. They'll finish packing up the boxes so we can get them loaded and take them to the central pickup spot. So pretty cool. Tell you what, I'm going to take a moment and pray for the shoeboxes. 
um, because there's going to be, I don't know, millions of shoeboxes going out all across the world. And uh, what a tremendous opportunity to spread the joy of Christmas along with the message of Jesus. Tell you what, I'm going to have you guys stand. Stand with me, will you? And let's just pray a blessing over these shoeboxes as they go out across the world. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to impact millions of children all across this world. God, I pray a special blessing upon each box. God, I pray that as each child gets a box of gifts, Lord, that they would be touched by the love that went into each box as, as people packed them. God, I ask that their hearts would turn to Jesus, that they would be open to the message of God's love for them, how Jesus came to earth. That was a special gift for all of us because he was going to die on a cross for our sins. God, may that message ring loud and clear to each child that gets a box. God, we ask for your spirit to move in an unbelievable way upon each child's heart as they receive a box. Because, Father, we want them to know of Jesus' love. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Our devotions today is taken from John chapter 10, verses 14 to 18. It reads like this. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my father. There are two things that struck me in this passage. One is Jesus saying that I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. Yes, there was a lot of sheep in the sheep pen, but Jesus' heart was to bring more sheep into the sheep pen. Reminded, reminded me of 2 Peter 3.9, where it talks about that God's not slack concerning his promises. No. <laughs> He's patient because he doesn't want anyone to perish, but that all come to repentance. That's his heart. He wants more sheep into a sheep pen. Ties in perfectly with the shoe boxes. The second thing that struck me in this passage was that Jesus said, Hey, yeah, I'm going to lay down my life, but no one takes it from me. I have total control. I am sovereign over that. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. I willingly do it voluntarily. No one's making me, but because of love, I do this. They're the two things that I picked out of today's passage. Join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for the opportunity to come and worship. Father, as we have come together to worship, 
Father, may you be pleased with our heart's attitude. Lord, as we worship before you today, may you be pleased with our attitude, our desire to give you all the honor and glory today. Lord, we continue to pray for those who need physical healing in our midst. We pray for Jim Hur as he recovers from surgery on his wrist. Lord, we pray for Donna as she continues to recover from a broken ankle. And John Coverly as he has so many health issues. But God, thank you that he's doing much better. Lord, we pray for Mark Hoover as he recovers from shoulder surgery. And Edna Sampson as she recovers from heart valve replacement. And for Joey Neff, as he recovers from surgery on his foot. God, thank you that some of them are here today and are doing well. God, we praise you for that. Lord, continue to give healing in each of their bodies. Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to partner with the Association of African Bible Schools. They're our mission partners of, uh, in November here. Lord, we pray that you would help them to empower local churches in Africa to establish Bible schools, to provide biblical teaching and resources to pastors and church leaders. God, use them in a mighty way to disciple others concerning the Word of God. Lord, we pray for young life as they minister here in southern Chester County in our local schools. God, bless those leaders and empower them to make disciples of high school kids. So in turn, they can reach their friends and make more disciples. God, bless that ministry. Father, I pray for those in our midst that have suffered loss this year. And as we get close to the holidays, God, we know that it's a difficult time, that their loved one is not here and not able to participate in the family gatherings anymore. So, God, I pray for each one as they deal with that loss afresh. Lord, as they continue their walk of grief from the passing of a loved one, God, that you would give them strength, that you would bear them up during this time. And Lord, I know that as we have gathered here this morning, we have come to worship. Lord, we, we all have needs. We all have needs that we need to bring before the throne of grace. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to come to the throne of grace, God. And Lord, I pray for each one here God, minister to the needs that they have in their life. God, they know what they are. You know what they are. So, God, through your spirit, minister to them. Father, encourage them today. Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do as you work in us. God, use this worship service this morning to encourage us, to help us to grow deep in our faith. God, that we can just be more than a Christian. We can be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We invite you guys to stand and continue worshiping with us this morning. This next song is great as we go into the Thanksgiving week, reminding us to give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever.
time of the morning for some of our young ones to disperse. It is time for Children's Church and Waterway 25. So, Children's Church is for kids between four years old and first grade. You guys can come on down. And Waterway 25 is for kids between grades <clears throat> two and, Brandon, five. <laughs> two and five. See, I know that candy in the front row, you got to stay, you got to stay on the ball because the pastor might even call on you. But it won't be hard questions. It'll be stuff like, you know, what grade is Waterway 25 for? Hey, I'm glad you got, oh, we got, we got drinks and everything. What'd you bring me, Tucker? <laughs> you're the, so you're the garbage man. Oh, you're, you, I'm glad you are taking care of Blake that way. Good. You, you always do what he asks you to do? Not all the time. Well, that's a good little brother. Well, hey, I'm glad you guys are here today. And I'm glad it looks like you are ready for Children's Church and Waterway 2-5. And so can we pray together? Do you remember how we pray? If, if you haven't been here before, this is what, you don't have to do this because there's lots of ways to pray. But one of the ways I like to pray sometimes is I usually put my hands together and I bow my head and close my eyes. It helps me to think about Jesus. So we're going to pray. Jesus, thank you for these boys and girls. Lord, you are amazing. We just sang how great you are. And so, Lord, thank you for allowing us to be here. And I pray that as these kids go to Children's Church and Waterway 2-5, I pray that they will learn something about you that they'll never forget, something that will change their lives and help them to grow even closer to you. Lord, this is our prayer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, boys and girls. I think I see some uh, Children's Church leading kind of folk out there in the lobby. So why don't you go join them? I'm so glad that you guys are here. Not only are the children here, but we have uh, a few other guests with us today. Today, um, JC and Lois Ebersole are with us. JC is the director of AABS. Uh, Steve mentioned them here during our prayer time this morning. 
Um, and I'm going to let him tell you more about what is going on with AABS. But these are one of our mission partners. We've been working with the, these guys and supporting them uh, for years now. And so I'm going to invite JC to come forward and share. I told him he could sit anywhere he wanted to in here. So it's always a fun adventure to see where people end up and, and see how they navigate their way to the stage. Um, but JC, I'm glad that you're here. Um, I'm going to pray for you, and then I'm going to ask you to share what God has put on your heart to share with us. All right? God, I thank you for this chance to be together today. I thank you for the work that is happening even right now uh, through the efforts of AABS. Lord, we know that you are the one who makes all things go. But I thank you for JC and Lois and, and for his work that they've been able to do to help organize and, and, and keep things going. Lord, bless him now as he tells us what's going on and how we can continue to be part of this mission together to share your truth around the world. Lord, we love you. I pray you'll bless him to speak, bless us to hear. Amen. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Jesse. God bless you. Um, it's our privilege to be here with you today. My wife, Lois, and I are delighted to be here. It's our first time to see your new building. We've been at uh, Media Church building for quite a few times, but it's great to be here, see what God has given you, and we rejoice with you in this uh, lovely sanctuary and facility that you have. Thanks for inviting us. It's our privilege to be with you once again. David Shibley, author of the book, The Mission's Addiction, makes this statement. 85 to 90 percent of the two million church leaders in developing nations have not had the opportunity of formal training for ministry in a Bible school or seminary, but they're out there on the front lines of spiritual combat just the same, slugging it out with little training and few resources. Their desperate cry is for encouragement in the battle, relevant on-site training and resources for ministry. Here at ABS, we provide uh, all of those things for them and more. Many of you know that the Africa Association of Bible Schools has been resourcing Bible training centers in Africa since our beginning in 2004. Some of these resources that we offer them are 62 curricular courses, many documents helpful for their day-to-day -day running of the Bible training centers, diplomas for the graduates, encouragement and advice, annual conferences that equip the Bible school directors, and other things. To date, we've been privileged to serve hundreds of Bible schools in 16 countries of Africa and beyond. Last year, AABS joined the Hopewell Network of Churches, which is a group of churches here in the U.S. They are also serving eight overseas networks of churches. The Hopewell Network leaders invited me to explain what we offer to Bible schools to many of these overseas groups. As a result of this connection and other relationships as well, we are now also resourcing Bible schools in Mexico, Haiti, Costa Rica, and three ministries in India. Because of serving Bible training centers beyond Africa, we recently registered two doing business as names with our state of Pennsylvania. There are, excuse me, these are All Nations Association of Bible Schools and our acronym AABS. We plan to maintain our original name for the work in Africa. You will notice our acronym AABS applies to both All Nations Association and the Africa Association of Bible Schools. I will close with a testimony. During a visit to Kenya earlier this year, I met the director and students from one of our current Bible training centers there. The local church bishop shared her observation of the two pastors from her church 
who enrolled in the school. After the death of the previous pastor, they were assigned to lead. Because they had no theological training, they became students in this AABS school. And I quote her, the results, they are now able to teach, preach, and evangelize the neighborhood. They have started several new programs, including a ministry to the destitute, family counseling, and all-night prayers. They are making a very positive change in a village where there has been a problem of drunken youth. I recommend this type of college, for it has met a deep spiritual need in their village. This is the program I am advocating for our rural areas, and I will make an effort to make many denominations join this course. To have their pastors, Sunday school teachers, youth pastors, and clergy be trained and equipped for better service in their churches and ministries. Thanks. End quote. Bishop Priscilla Bogo. AABS and I are deeply grateful for your partnership with us here at Waterway Church. Without you and others like you, we could not do this work. And we pray that God generously will reward your prayers and your financial gifts to us. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you, JC. And so uh, we got to hear a little bit about what AABS is up to. Uh, we got to see what some of the different acronyms are, and we're going to be supporting them uh, financially, but also with our prayers this month in November as we continue to, to go through this month. But it strikes me, um, I was really excited to hear that testimony most of all. It's good to hear what God is doing around the world through the ministries that we support and, and even through ministries that we have no official connection with. It's good to know that God is still at work because let's be honest, have any of you ever wondered if God is still at work in your life, like nearby? Have any of you ever, or, or maybe have you felt like maybe God took the day off today? It, it doesn't feel like God is close or it doesn't. We, we know in our minds, many of us, that God is always at work and always with us, but sometimes it feels like we are distant. So it is good to be reminded of these stories and, and the ways that God is working to rise up leaders, to make a difference in the world, even in places where most of us will never go. And so it is with that in mind that I'm going to do something very risky, dangerous, and frankly, I'm a little nervous about it. I'm going to carry this microphone around the room and ask if any of you have any testimonies of Thanksgiving to share. There is a holiday coming up on Thursday. It is Thanksgiving. There is a worship service tonight sponsored by the Oxford Ministerium at the Methodist Church in town. If any of you want to come out, uh, that's at 7 o'clock this evening. It's a, a Thanksgiving service. And we are uh, kind of going to be thinking about an attitude of thanks for the rest of today. But I want to do like we used to do. JC talked about our time over at Media Mennonite Church. There was a time years ago when we used to hand the microphone around and, and ask about prayer requests and all that. This is not a time for prayer requests, okay? I am going to ask you, congregation, what are you thankful about? And if you would like to raise your hand and share, you may do that in one sentence. I'm not going to hand you the mic. I'm going to hold it up to your mouth. Because when I hear a period, I'm going to take it away and go to the next person. Because we have a little bit of time, but we're not going to spend all morning. But I know that there are a lot of you who have a lot of things to be thankful about. And I wonder what sentences of thanks you have. If you have something you want to share with us and that we can thank God with you about, raise your hand and let's hear your sentence. And if you're going to raise your hand and I'm in your corner of the room, it would be handy for you to raise your hand now and not make me zigzag back and forth. Come on over, Lorna. I am very thankful that God saved the life of my husband a week and a half ago in what could have been a really bad automobile accident. We are thankful. We are thankful for God's protection in what could have been a very bad 
automobile accident. All together, let's say we give thanks to God. We give thanks to God. What else are we thankful for? Right here. I am so thankful for this church and all of the people in it. I, I love it. Sundays are my best day. So thank you, Waterway. Thank you, God. Amen. We give thanks to God. We give thanks to God. A lot of conjunctions today, John. <laughs> Who else is thankful? As we talked about in Sunday school, for his incomparable riches of God's grace. I think that's a lost. Uh, that, was, that, was a, that was a period. You even had four days to get ready and you couldn't do one sentence. Oh, pastor. No, we are, we are thankful for God's incomparable glory. We can't make it short. We? No, you're right. We give thanks to God. I'm thankful for God's healing over my broken body. Amen. Amen. We give thanks to God. Yeah. As I was up in New York City yesterday, parked beside somebody that was living in a cardboard box, I was thankful that I could go home to a nice warm house. Amen. We give thanks to God. Um, I'm thankful for this little guy right here. He turns one tomorrow, and um, I had, like, a really difficult pregnancy with him. Um, and my delivery was really hard, and just I'm flooding with, like, emotions and memories today. Um, but he's here, and he's okay. And we give thanks to God. We give thanks to God. So I'll try not to cry. Um, I'm thankful that we've had the opportunity to foster Aiden and Avery. Um, they're actually going home on Tuesday back with their mom. Um, unfortunately, we'll, we've become very close to her. She's become a good friend, so we'll still get to see them. We give thanks to God for what God is doing. Mm -hmm. I'm thankful for my son, Aaron, because I also had a um, trouble delivery, and I'm thankful that he's here. We give thanks to God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> that guy shared a minute ago. You, you, you couldn't have saved me some... St his hand up. We are thankful for God, to God um, for the health that our son-in-law David now has after the surgery, um, the appendectomy surgery that he had, and he's fine. We give thanks to God. We're thankful for good medical procedure for David. I'm thankful for the family I was raised in. Amen. We give thanks to God. Can anybody else say amen? I, I thought I... I'm thankful for God's awesome power healing for my brother, my husband Mark here, and that is steadfast with being there always through everything that we have to deal with in life. His love for us is unbelievable. Praise God for his love and healing. Amen. We give thanks to God. Hey, I'm thankful for Buzz's dedication to the lighthouse over these years. Thank God. Amen. We give thanks to God. Are there any other sentences of thanksgiving? Okay, okay. Hey, let's, uh, let's pray one more time together. Would you join me in a word of prayer? God, we have heard in our midst many things to be thankful for. Some of us have so many things that it's difficult even to put it into one sentence or less. But God, you have blessed us. Even those of us who are struggling, we recognize that in the midst of the struggle, there is blessing. So God, we take this time to say thank you. In the midst of it all, and even in light of the struggles that we know that we will face, Lord, we say thank you for being our God, for allowing us to be your children, and for providing so generously. 
in so many different ways for so long. Lord, we love you, and we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that this is a philosophical truth. But one of the things that I've noticed is that thankfulness, as important as it is, thankfulness often gets replaced by many of us with regret. I don't know that regret is the opposite of being thankful. But as I think about my attitude, I recognize that regret is one of those things that can bump out thankfulness if I'm not careful. Because instead of being grateful for the things that have happened, I wish they had gone differently. Do any of you live with regrets? I mean, some of you might have big regrets. Some of you might have made some messes in your life. Some of you might have been through some struggles. You might have even caused some struggles, and, and they, they cause you to regret. You're not thankful for the things that you did. You regret them. Some of you just have little regrets, things that are more insignificant. Oh, I wish I wouldn't have said it that way the kind of regrets that make you wish that you could redo a conversation. Some of you have insignificant regrets, but they, they still touch you. I, I wish I would have bought the, the red truck instead of the blue truck because, boy, the, the blue truck just shows all this dirt, or the red truck just looks so... Right? We have these regrets, some of them big and life-changing, some of them just small and minor. Some of us get, get hung up, instead of being thankful for what is we get hung up on what could have been. And I just want to kind of prime you today. As we look at this passage in Mark chapter 14, we've been working through Mark for the better part of this year. As we look at Mark 14, and, and this is a period uh, of time right before Jesus dying on the cross, I'd like to imagine with you what could have been and then we're going to wrap up this time. As we think about what could have been, we're, we're going to realize how good the truth is. So that's where we're going today. Open your Bibles, Mark chapter 14. We're going to start around verse 43. The story is continuing from where we left off last week. We have this story of Jesus. He's, he's in Jerusalem. It's a time of great celebration. It's a, it's a holiday time. And there is this knowledge that Jesus has that he is marching towards his death. He knows that he is going to die. He knows that his life on earth is near an end, even though he's only in his early 30s. And he knows that it's going to hurt. In fact, we pick up here in Mark 14, Jesus has been praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He told all of his disciples that they're going to turn away from him. They all said, no, we're going to follow you to the very end. Peter said, especially me, I'm going to follow you to the very end. Jesus goes out to the garden. He prays. His friends fall asleep when they're supposed to be praying with him and watching over him. They fall asleep again even after he woke them up. These are his closest friends. And so it says in Mark 14, actually in verse 41, returning to them a third time, Jesus said, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. This is Mark chapter 14, verses 41 and 42. This is Jesus being arrested. He's going to die on Friday. This is late in the night Thursday, early in the morning Friday. So he's within 24 hours of his death. He's been praying, and Judas has done his work. We see this in verse 43. Just as Jesus was speaking, Judas, one of the 12, so one of the 12 disciples was supposed to be on the inner circle, knew as much about Jesus as anyone did, had seen as much of Jesus' work as anyone had. One of the 12, Judas, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. And so Jesus is being arrested by this little gang with swords and clubs in the middle of the night, and they've been sent by the religious authorities. Now, Jesus was a Jew, right? Ethnically, and he had the bloodlines, and, and he had grown up going to temple. He, he knew, he had fulfilled, in fact, all of the Jewish law. But the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders wanted him arrested. They had been watching him now for a number of years. They hated him. They despised his work. There were a few who turned to faith in him, who believed and acknowledged that he was the Son of God, but many believed that he was a madman taking away their power. So here comes Judas, and here comes this group of people that were sent to arrest Jesus. It says in verse 44, the betrayer, this is Judas, 
had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. See, it's the middle of the night. Jesus might have been hard to recognize among all of his other disciples. They were also young Jewish men. It's also interesting to me that these guys who were out arresting didn't even really know what Jesus looked like, did they? But they're doing their job, sent by the chief priests, the teachers of law, and the elders. Verse 45, going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Now, hold your thumb there at that little portion of the scripture. We're going to pick up a few verses later in just a minute. But I thought it was interesting. One of the fun things about studying Mark or any of the other gospels is you can compare them. There are four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all very similar. They, they, have, um, they have some differences in style because three different men wrote them, but they tell a lot of the same stories, and, and they just kind of bring out different details. John, John has, has a, uh, a whole different style about him, but it's really fun to read these three, uh, three four gospels and, and figure out, okay, what are all the details? Because Mark is very brief. He's to the point. He keeps things moving. Matthew gives a little bit more detail. In Matthew's gospel, when Jesus is arrested, Jesus says this to the people around him. He says, do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? He's talking to these guys who are in this crowd coming to him with clubs and swords in the middle of the night. And in fact, he's talking to his own disciples, some of whom had drawn their little daggers and, and were getting ready for kind of a dust up, a, a little bit of a fight here. Jesus says, do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Today earlier, Steve read Jesus saying, I lay down my life for the sheep. I choose to do this. Here we see the depth of Jesus' choice. He has just been praying in the garden, Father, if it's possible, take this away from me. I don't want to have to go through this. But Father, your will be done, not mine. And now, finally, the arrest is happening just as Jesus said it would. Judas leading the group just as Jesus said he would. And now everybody coming out with swords and clubs. Jesus says, I could have 12 legions of angels at my command. A legion, that's a military term. There's, it's interesting, if you do a little bit of work, you'll see that there were different ways that the word legion was used back in that day because there were different armies in different places. Some people say, well, a legion is six, seven, eight thousand soldiers, but 6,000 is kind of the beginning. Others say that a legion might have been 24,000 soldiers. Either way, the picture that we're getting here is Jesus says, I can call on 12 of these legions full of angels. And so 12 legions, we're looking at somewhere between 72,000 and, if you do some quick math, 288,000 angels. Jesus says, guys, swords and clubs in a garden in the middle of the night, disciples, you're going to hold them off? He says, I don't need you. Peter, put your sword away. This little dagger you're bring. I could call out 12 legions of angels if I needed them. And church, just in case you forget, there's a story in Isaiah 37 about how one angel wiped out 185,000 evil Assyrians in one night. One angel can take out 185,000 men in an evening. Jesus says, I've got 70,000, 80,000. I've got 300,000 of these fellows that I can call down. Swords and clubs? Really? Really? In this story here that Mark is telling, this true story, this account of what really happened, it's interesting, Mark keeps things going, keeps things right to the point, but this detail just blew me away, and I got to thinking, maybe you've wondered this. If Jesus could have done that, I wonder if it was difficult for him to not do that. Because I have things in my life that I wish I could have done differently, but I didn't have the power to do it. I didn't have the wisdom, I didn't have the foresight, I didn't have the knowledge. Oh, I just wish I would have made that choice instead of the one I made, but I did the best I could. I wish I would have bought that instead of that because this thing ended up being a lemon, but I didn't know that. I wish I would have, I wish I would have just invested a couple hundred dollars there because it'd be worth a couple million dollars now, but you don't know that in the moment, right? Jesus knew what was going to unfold. Jesus knew what was coming. Jesus knew what his father's will was, and he was absolutely yielded to it. But Jesus had so much power at his hands. He could have done everything. And it got me wondering, 
it got me wondering what it might have been like if he had done it differently. If Jesus could call down 72,000 angels, each one who can take out 185,000 guys in an evening, couldn't he, have, couldn't he have fixed a whole lot more about the world before he died? I mean, when Jesus died, the world was not politically turned upside down. When Jesus died, there were crooked characters in office, close to his hometown and far away in Rome and all around the world. With a force like 12 legions of angels, Jesus could have wiped out all the bad guys and still go to the cross. I got wondering about that. What, what would it have been like if, if Jesus would have answered some of the calls that the, that the Jewish people had? To, okay, Messiah, well, let's, let's restore the kingdom back to Israel. Let's think, make things right ge- geopolitically here. I mean, have any of you ever wished that you could kind of call on 72,000 angels to fix some of the problems in your world? Would, would those characters be helpful in East Nottingham Township, in Oxford, in Chester County, in Pennsylvania, in Harrisburg? in Washington, D.C., in the Ukraine? What if we had that kind of power? Wouldn't it have been something? I mean, here is Jesus, and and what we see is he lets these jokers arrest him. These guys with swords and clubs, they don't even know who he is. He has to be kissed by Judas. Jesus lets this all happen because he knows it's part of the plan, and of course it's part of the plan, and there's prophecy, and, and it was right, and it was perfect, but it does make me wonder it does make me, what if he had just waited a couple more days? Or, or what if he just waited for the festival next year and, and put some angels to work first? Does your mind ever go to those kind of places? Instead of being thankful about what actually happened, you start to, to have regrets or, or wonder what could have been? Oh, boy. It can make for some interesting conversations, but it's a frustrating way to live life. Jesus had all of this power. Well, let's look what happened. Verse 53. I'm picking up at verse 53, Hans. The men seized Jesus, arrested him. They took Jesus, verse 53, to the high priests. And all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. Here in the next little bit, we're going to see two trials happening. Jesus under trial with the Jewish leaders. Peter under trial for his life here in the courtyard. How's it unfold? Look at verse 55. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin, this is, this is kind of the, some religious leaders that were there around the temple, were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they didn't find any. Now, do you think Jesus, who could have called down more than 12 legions of angels, do you think he could have replaced them with some better judges? Do you think he could have overthrown the courts and, and put into place some people who could make some better, wiser decisions? Of course he could have, but he didn't do that. He let this, he let this clown show continue. These people want to kill him, but they can't find any evidence. Verse 56, many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. These clowns couldn't even get false witnesses to at least plan. Hey, what are you going to say about him? Then, verse 57, some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I'll destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days we'll build another not made with hands. Verse 59, yet not even their testimony agreed. (laughs) These people are arresting Jesus, and Jesus says, I could call down 12 legions of angels, but I'm not going to. I'm going to let this happen. And and now he goes into this trial, and and everybody's trying to accuse him because they need a reason to kill him, and they don't all agree. And Jesus lets it happen because there's a plan unfolding. But wouldn't this be frustrating if you could change it all? Verse 60, then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, are you not going to answer What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? What Jesus could have said, oh, do you ever imagine conversations that you could have had over and over? What Jesus could have said is, well, they don't even agree with each other. What Jesus could have said is, they're all telling lies one after another after another. Can't you hear? Their testimony doesn't even agree. What Jesus could have said is, you guys have no idea. And he could have said everything right. But Jesus, verse 61, remained silent and gave no answer. It was not in his mission this time to make the courts right. It was not in his mission at this time to make the religious rulers right. It was not in his mission at this time to continue to promote his own freedom. It was not in his mission at this time to continue to do things the way he wanted to do it. Jesus was submitted to God. He remained silent. 
He gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? And now, when things are finally getting real, Jesus speaks up and said, yes. In fact, he said, I am. I am the Messiah, the son of the blessed one. Now there is truth being spoken. Jesus says, I am. And he says, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. And Jesus says, yes, I am the Messiah. I am the son of the blessed one. And he says, you will see me sitting at God's right hand and you will see me coming back on the clouds of heaven. This was offensive to the crooked liars who were running the court. Says the high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. They're all liars anyway. You've heard the blasphemy, what do you think? And then all the people, it says, they condemned him as worthy of death. Do you feel the injustice? I mean, I know there are a lot of us who have read this story often. We, we've heard it over and over. Oh yeah, Jesus was arrested and there was a false trial. And it was, but do you see the miscarriage of justice here? Does that rankle any of you? Does, does it make you angry? Even though, I mean, this is part of, God used this and our salvation comes out of Jesus' death and his resurrection. I mean, good things happened as a result, but yet, oh, there's a human part of me that says, couldn't there have been a better way? All of this craziness over and over and over, they all condemned him as worthy of death? Verse 65, then some, and these are the religious leaders, okay? In court, after this sham of a trial, what did they do? They began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. This is the trial of Jesus, and it's ridiculous. But Jesus goes along with it, and he lets it happen because it's leading to something that is going to change lives forever. Now, there was another trial that was happening. In verse 66, it says that while Peter was below in the courtyard, Peter, that one who said that he would stay with Jesus till the end, Peter, that one who said, even though everybody else will fall away, I would die for you, Jesus, Peter goes through his own kind of a trial. It says one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. Peter was just out hanging around by the fire trying to get warm. There were a lot of guards there. And when she saw Peter warming himself, perhaps she could see his face now because he was close to the fire. She looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. What happened? Remember Jesus, when, when he was told who he was, he said, yes, I am. Here's Peter. It says, Peter denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said. And then he went out into the entranceway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. And again, he denied it. No, no. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. And Galilean, that's a guy from a different town. It's like, well, of course you're from that area. I hear your accent. I hear the way that you say water, water, water. You, you came from Galilee, didn't you? But even with that truth spoken, it says in verse 71 that Peter began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. And immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And Peter broke down and wept. The trial of Jesus going inside, a mockery, a sham. The witnesses can't even all agree. But Jesus sticks with the truth. He says, yes, I am the Son of God, and I'm going to change everything in its time. Peter goes through his trial, and he folds. Over and over again, he folds. He even calls down curses. Guys, I, he, he's, he's there swearing that he is not associated with Jesus. In the midst of all of this story, it just seems like everything's mixed up, doesn't it? There are these two trials. They say Jesus is worthy of death when he's actually the Messiah. Peter's trying to, to escape out of this, even though now, by his own 
admission. He is worthy of death. These religious leaders, they should be seeking truth. They should be guiding people towards the Lord, but they're parading out lies. Everything is messed up. What we're going to see next week is that as Jesus is taken before the governing authorities of the the political area, there's just all kinds of, Pilate is just a mess. He's wishy-washy. He's not a man of conviction. He's got no real wisdom about him. There's nothing that says this guy should be a leader. And yet Jesus allows himself to be at his mercy. This whole story leading up to Jesus' death, all the ways that the people acted, except for Jesus, everybody else just seems to be such a mess, and yet Jesus stands firm through all of it. Jesus gave himself up as he planned to. Jesus died on the cross as God intended and put our sins to death. And then a few days later, Jesus rose from the grave showing the power of God and showing us that we can rise from our deathly lives as well. Even in the midst of all the mess, Jesus came through and things happened the way they should have been. And so here is my question for you. There may be things in your life that you regret. There may be things that you need to be forgiven of. I hope you'll repent. When Peter denied Jesus three times and we realized that what did he do? It says he broke down and he wept. Peter eventually repented to Jesus. Peter was restored to Jesus. Peter became a hero of the faith. That's the kind of life-changing work that Jesus would do on the cross. But you may have things that you regret in your life. I wonder, though, if you can look back with thankfulness at what Jesus did and let that wash out all the regrets. I wonder if you can look at at the gift of Jesus Christ and, and let that cover over all the stuff that shouldn't have been or that you wish hadn't been. I know there are things that we must heal from. There are things that we may need counseling for. We may need to talk to our friends about. We may need to walk with other believers through some of our issues. But I wonder at the heart of everything in our day-to-day thoughts and as we think about what could have been, what might have been, what I wish I would have done, I wonder if instead we can be thankful for what Jesus did do in the midst of all of the crazy. Because what I see here is hope for our lives today. Even in a messed up world where the religious leaders were trouble. Even in a messed up world where the justice system was a problem. Even in a messed up world where we're going to see the the politics of the area were far from ideal. And the people of Israel felt like they were under political slavery. Even in the midst of all that, Jesus could work. So is there anything that you're dealing with that he can't handle? Is there any regret of your past that he can't heal you from? Is there any challenge of your future that Jesus can't walk with you through? I guess for me, I'm trying to not think so much about what could have been, but I'm trying to be thankful for what is, for the fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on a cross, willingly, didn't have to, but he died on a cross so that he could die for my sin and for yours and for anybody who turns to him and asks for forgiveness. And then Jesus Christ rose from the grave, showing that indeed he does have God's power. He is the Son of God. He's not just a crazy guy hanging on a cross. And now Jesus says, I will be with you forever. I'm trying to be thankful about that instead of all the could have been, should have been, and what might have been. Will you pray with me, church? God, it is... <laughs> God, I think it's fun to look at your Bible and see what you have done. God, I think it's even fun to imagine what it might have been like to be there. Lord, it's interesting sometimes to think about, well, what if things had been different? But Lord, I am so thankful for the truth that we see that even though our human perspectives have all kinds of ideas, and even though there are, there are all these what-ifs and, and could have been, Lord, I thank you for what you've done. I thank you for giving us a way back to you so that we don't have to die in our sins. We don't have to be far from you because of our foolishness, because of our sin, because of our evil. 
Lord, I thank you that we can be forgiven of all that, that we can be restored back to you, that we can be healed, and that even as we take on injuries in this life, Lord, that we can be made whole in your presence. Thank you, God. I thank you that in the midst of bad governments, in the midst of bad justice systems, in the midst of bad religion, in the midst of people trying to take us out with swords and clubs, Lord, when we face any of those things, I thank you that we can come back to you and know that no matter what happens to us, you are watching over us and your good will prevail. Lord, help us to remember that in these dark days. Help us to remember your goodness in the times when we wonder if there's anything to be thankful about. And Lord, help us to face these times with the kind of faith and hope and assurance that Jesus exhibited. Lord, help us. Thank you. And help us. We love you, Lord. Amen. Church, will you stand and sing with us our, our closing song? Shout to the Lord. Let's shout to the Lord. shared with us and testified that God is at work even in the midst of a dark and crazy world. You raised your hands and you shared testimonies about thanks for things that God is doing in a dark and evil time. We have looked at the scripture and we can see that Jesus brought life. 
God was at work even in the time when all the systems around him were a terrible mess. God was able to bring Jesus through and, and Jesus was able to do exactly what needed to be done. Now I hope that you will go from this place now taking your testimony and your thanksgiving and telling the whole world that no matter what happens around us, God is still the Lord. He still gives life and he still brings hope. This is the message. So go take it. Shout to the north and the south and the east and the west. Tell them about Jesus Christ who rises above it all. All right, go be the church. We'll see you next time.